Okay. Um, thanks for coming, guys. I've been given the thumbs up so I can get started now. Uh, so today's talk that I'm giving is uh, just about mapping and geolocation in Drupal. Uh, I'm actually just mainly going through the Budget Victoria website that uh, Salsa Digital built back in April. So a little bit about me. Um, I actually got our designer uh, stupidly to take a look at this uh, presentation and all of a sudden this uh, very impressive slide turned up. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've been, a, been working with Drupal for about eight years now uh, and you can see that it looks like I've done lots of really impressive things. Um, so a little bit about Salsa Digital. Uh, we're an enterprise digital agency in Victoria. I've uh, been around for about 12 years. Uh, mainly Acquia certified developers. Um, we're one of the GovCMS partners. A lot of you have probably heard about GovCMS while you've been here. Uh, and I'm the GovCMS trainer as well. So if anyone's in Canberra and wants some GovCMS training, I uh, can come and see my face again. Oh. And uh, here are a few of the Drupal and government projects that we've worked on in the past. Okay, so let's get on to some of the content. So in general, why do we need maps on websites? I don't think uh, many people are building websites without a map uh, these days. Basically, everyone wants to know where, where are you? Uh, where is the stuff that you're actually selling or doing? Um, also, you know, what things are actually around the location that uh, whatever it is you are doing, uh, you know, what things are around there. Um, obviously, you know, responsive is one of the things you really need to think about uh, when you're building a map. Uh, there's a lot of difficulties with mapping once you, you know, go down to a mobile size in particular. Um, and so essentially, I mean, the main thing you have a map for is to, you know, show people where they can actually get what they want. So geolocation, I think, is probably the other half of, uh, of that story. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, a lot of traffic is actually moving to mobile, so people actually want to know what's relevant to them uh, as they're actually walking around and, and doing things. So, uh, I mean, I know one of the things I do, because I travel a bit for work, uh, as soon as I get somewhere, I'm usually looking up the website of whoever it is I'm going to see, uh, finding out where I can get coffee. You know, somewhere around there before I get to the meeting and how long that's going to take me from wherever I'm staying because uh, those are kind of the re really important things. Um, some of the other things that uh, people don't always think about with geolocation uh, is taking that outside of uh, mapping. Uh, we've got one of our large uh, international corporate clients. Um, they don't actually have any maps at all on their site so they're using geolocation to actually serve up uh, completely separate content. So people come in from a different country, so uh, France or even uh, Northern Ireland, uh, and they've actually landed on the UK site. We just redirect them back to you know, the appropriate site for their location. So I mean, that's one of the fairly basic things that you can do with geolocation, but it's, uh, it's still one of the uses that um, is quite important. Uh, one of the other things that you can do is actually uh, use, say, Google Analytics events as well with your geolocation and start really pinpointing where the people are who are actually using your website uh, and what those people are doing. So geolocation kind of goes you know, a long way outside of uh, just what's in a map. Um, actually, yeah, one other thing, I think, um, I'm not sure if Acquia has done a presentation on their Lyft product as well, but just around personalization, uh, you can actually do a lot of personalization based on locations as well. So. You know, if someone's actually viewing your website in Melbourne, you can show sales, you know, for your Melbourne stores or something instead. Okay. So it should be quite easy, uh, and uh, a lot of the time it kind of is, depending on exactly what your requirements are. There are, are a number of uh, modules and libraries out there. Uh, Leaflet is um, probably one of the better ones that I've used. Um, it's really great at actually putting a leaflet.js map on your site. Uh, the problem is it doesn't actually do the geolocation part of it. Um, so in order to do that, you need to use another module called the uh, IP Geolocations Views and Maps that integrates in with views, integrates in with the leaflet module. All of a sudden, that's great. You've got geolocation, you've got a map, 
and everything's working quite well. The problem with that is the way that it uses session variables, it actually kills off your cache, and all of a sudden, every single page you're serving up is authenticated, and if you're trying to run Varnish or other you know, caching tools in front of your website, they're no longer in the picture. So that uh, becomes a bit of a problem. Um, there is a module as well for Google Maps. Uh, once again, kind of similar, similar story. It provides that mapping for you. You don't get all of the geolocation and, and things like that straight out of the box. So once again, there is actually a lot more work that you need to do um, outside of just you know, clicking install the module. Um, outside of uh, Drupal, there are other tools like uh, National Maps. Um, we do quite a bit of work with government. So National Maps actually integrates with data.gov.au. Um, and it provides what is a very lightweight map. Um, and it's, all a, it's a JavaScript library that you can just implement fairly easily. It actually delivers uh, WMS tiles up, so it's actually a, um, it's very kind of light in terms of the download. But the problem is every time you want to click on something or do anything, it's actually sending a request back to the server again. So in terms of overall performance, it kind of is a little bit slow. So some of the requirements we had uh, were to actually build uh, an interactive map uh, on the site. Uh, it needed to show all of the different projects. So it wasn't just a simple map. We had to implement a large number of uh, pins. Um, we actually had to use uh, clustering as well on those pins um, and show a number of different regions. Uh, so unfortunately, a lot of the modules that actually kind of come out of the out of the box with uh, Drupal weren't actually going to do what it was that we needed. Um, and another issue we were, we were facing is we were using uh, GovCMS. Um, GovCMS is a great tool for government. One of the problems is you can't actually use any extra module code. So you can't install new modules. Uh, you don't have access to any custom code. So you really have to use what is kind of in the box. So. I'm just going to show you a couple of uh, example sites of um, what we were trying to build. So regions.vic.gov.au uh, was actually the site that uh, we were being asked to model this new website off. And you can see that um, what we've ended up with is actually fairly close. Uh, the design is actually very similar. And uh, one of the main components of this site is the uh, explore the budget map. So you can see here what we've uh, needed to implement was a list of all of the budget projects right across the state of Victoria. Uh, we've got some filters here that uh, filter by local government area or local, local council. Um, those are then split up into what they've called priorities, uh, which are just basically categories that are linked to each of those projects. And uh, you can actually search there for uh, specific projects. Uh, I'm going to remove one of those filters. Hang on, there we go. Um, so we've got uh, a number of pins that actually appear on the map. So we can see we're using clustering to actually show that there are five pins in this area, rather than kind of dotting five pins right next to each other and making them difficult to click on. Uh, you can kind of click on those maps there, on those kind of uh, areas there. And uh, as we zoom in, we actually get to see uh, the rest of these pins. So if we click on one of the projects and go to more info, kind of these uh, pop-ups appear over the top of the map. OK. How's it working? So I'm basically just showing you this is what we need to implement, and a couple of things. We'll, we'll get into how it works in, uh, in just a minute. I think I'm only about five minutes in, so. <laughs> OK. Nice. So I'm having some mouse issues at the moment. Ah. I'm 
just got some odd things happening with my mouse, sorry about that. Okay, beautiful. Back to, back to where I was. So, yeah, as I mentioned, we're using uh, Cub CMS. So, one of the issues we had there was uh, there are no mapping modules in the Gov CMS platform. So, we didn't have access to the leaflet module or, or anything else that could kind of help us along. Uh, because there's no custom code, once again, we're kind of uh, a little bit uh, hamstrung with that. Uh, it was also a project with you know very tight timelines. Uh, I think we started off with about 12 weeks initially. Um, that kind of got shrunk down to uh, 10 weeks. Um, one of the problems we had was the federal government decided to bring the budget a week forward, uh, which meant basically the uh, start date or you know, the launch date for our project got brought a week forward as well. Um, what, one of the other issues we ended up facing was really large data files that we were going to have to present um, to people. Uh, so obviously you can't really have people downloading very large files. So these were some of the things that we needed to kind of overcome. Uh, and mainly that kind of affected uh, performance. Okay, so in order to find a solution, uh, what we did have access to was the theme layer in Drupal. Um, and uh, we actually added um, an, a module to GovCMS, which is uh, the services module and services views. Uh, basically what services does is it uh, allows you to take a view, just a standard view in Drupal, and output that as a serialized output. So we were actually outputting that as JSON. So all of a sudden, um, rather than having kind of a very large, heavy view uh, that we needed to consume on the front end, we actually had uh, some JSON output where we could access that you know, just through the theme layer, through our own custom JavaScript, uh, and build our own leaflet uh, JS maps. Uh, we also used uh, SVGs uh, in order to output um, another part of the map that I'll click through in just a moment. And uh, in terms of geolocation, we started looking at an external service called uh, IPFI. Um, the reason for that was, once again, we don't have any code that we can actually write. So we weren't able to do any of that uh, IP geolocation ourselves. Uh, so we had to kind of go outside to someone who can do it for us. Uh, it's actually a really great service. Um, you just send a request through um, with the IP address and it sends back a JSON string and actually tells you exactly where the location of the person is. So, very handy service if you ever need it. Okay. So, basically, uh, yeah, services, as I mentioned, kind of has a serialized output. Uh, we ended up using the REST server. Uh, which comes out of that, and uh, just um, accessing that via JSON. Uh, one of the lucky things we had, all of the data was actually public uh, on this particular project, so we didn't actually worry about the authentication, uh, but services module does integrate with, uh, with the OAuth module as well, uh, so you can actually put some security around um, what you output from uh, services. Um, and we ended up using three separate views, so we actually had uh, a list of all of the different regions. Um, so the regions list that we that I showed you before on the map, uh, a list of all of the priorities and, uh, and things listed uh, linked to those, and another view that um, listed all of the different projects. And then we kind of combined those together in, uh, in our own JavaScript. Okay. So just going to click on this quickly. So I'll just show you a couple of things within, um, within the services module. It's actually really, really quick to set up. Uh, you basically just add in a name, uh, a machine name for this. Uh, I've said that I want this to be a REST server and uh, a path to my endpoint. And um, basically, that's most of your setup right there. In your server settings, I've gone through and said that basically I want this to be output as JSON. And under my resources, I basically said I want access to retrieve views. 
So essentially, within a, a number of clicks, they've actually got. Um, don't you have a question? Oh, can you just okay. Um, yeah, so very quickly, we've actually got the uh, output that we need. I'm not sure what I'm actually clicking there to keep uh, popping out of my presentation. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so it gives me the speaker notes over here. But then... Oh, but then I can't see my notes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, here are some of the libraries that we uh, that we used. Um, Leaflet.js, uh, it's a really proper, uh, you know, popular JavaScript library for uh, making maps. Um, really, really simple to use, and the tutorials and stuff are, are fantastic if you want to actually uh, use that on any site that you that you're going to build. Uh, like I said, there is actually a Drupal module for Leaflet. Uh, it's in D7. The D8 port isn't working all that well as yet, but um, hopefully it'll be there some, sometime soon. Uh, we also used the marker cluster module, uh, so that's how we kind of created those uh, little, little clusters of pins. Um, we used the extra markers uh, library as well to actually uh, come up with our own custom markers. Uh, we needed to actually uh, list all of the points uh, in alphabetical order. Uh, Leaflet doesn't provide that functionality out of the box. Uh, but with extra markers, we were actually able to, to add those letters in there. Um, we ended up not using the shapefile library, but that was one of the libraries that we were looking at uh, when we did initially receive uh, the shapefiles, uh, as well as the, um, the JS zip library uh, in order to actually unzip the, uh, the file that we got. And I'll go through why that was in just a second. So I'm just going to pop onto the first part of the map, which was um, essentially a way to explore which council you actually belong to. So this is a fairly uh, basic SVG implementation as it is now. Um, the initial uh, problem that we had was we received all of the uh, shapefile data very late in the process. And what we'd been planning for is essentially having just one single map in, um, in Leaflet. Uh, so when this part of the process came in, what we were initially doing is displaying a, a Leaflet.js map here, um, using very flat tiles without any real design behind them. Uh, the big problem we had was the size of the, of the shapefile meant that just to load up this page here, uh, for someone was going to be incredibly slow. So what we did, uh, this is actually about a week after the initial go live, was we took these files and um, used a program called QGIS uh, to actually reduce the complexity of these files. Uh, so to simplify geometry is what it's called in QGIS. Uh, and then export all of these as, um, as SVGs, uh, which means that all of a sudden, what was initially actually a 27 meg download to uh, get the um, shape file uh, came down to about 100k. So obviously that's a lot more reasonable if, uh, if someone's trying to look at this on any device, really. Ah, I managed to do it without getting out of my presentation. Yes. Okay, and so here we have uh, the actual map itself. Um, so the main issue that we had when we first actually implemented this map was the size of the shapefile. It was uh, 25 meg. Um, initially, we were actually supposed to have a map that was going to render on mobile. And obviously, at that kind of size, it's just not going to work. Um, so we went through a, a process of uh, you know, looking at a few different options. Uh, one of those was to actually zip the, um, zip the file up. And so we managed to get the file size down to about 7 meg. Uh, still probably far too large. And uh, we ran into a number of issues then where um, actually um, 
unzipping that file uh, was taking you know, up to two minutes, depending on the browser, uh, a number of different browsers, i.e. obviously was um, just completely crashing whenever you tried to do that. So that was not a great option. Um, similar to the Explore map, we started talking to uh, Department of Premier and Cabinet about can we actually just reduce the complexity of these files. Um, the map that, or the uh, website that we were kind of uh, looking at initially was the um, regions website, uh, which is this one here, where they have nine uh, separate regions. And all of these shapes, as you can see, I mean, they're quite nice squares. There are only certain areas that are actually complicated. So the shape file that they were using was really quite small. Um, as you can see in here, these, uh, we have actually have 79 separate regions. Uh, the shapefiles were incredibly complicated and they told us that you know, because of legislative requirements we weren't actually allowed to simplify these down. So all of a sudden we didn't have much of an option to kind of reduce our file size. So things were looking a little bit scary uh, because we had a very large file, zipping didn't really work and um, basically we were trying to deliver a page that for a lot of people they weren't actually going to be able to see. So luckily, we've actually got our front-end dev down the front here, Alan, who came up with a handy solution, which is basically splitting out those 79 regions into individual regions. Um, and each one of those had their own shapefile. Uh, we also had the, the larger shapefile, which was all of Victoria. And uh, that was actually the largest part of the shapefile. I think that was about seven or eight megs uh, in itself. Um, because that was all of Victoria, we can kind of get around the legal requirements there and simplify that down so we can actually reduce that file size. And by doing that, we actually had a far more workable map. So the workflow for most people was to come in to the Explore by Map, click on one of these regions, and we can see that it's, um, it's fairly quick now because the only shapefile we're downloading is this one shapefile here, uh, rather than all 79. Uh, areas. So, um, yeah, so that actually ended up working quite well. Um, if someone actually does come in and they do want to see all of Victoria, then once again we can still pre present that entire region of Victoria in that, with that simplified shape file and um, it actually still is, uh, is quite snappy, which is handy. If someone did decide to go through all 79 regions, they do end up getting uh, to that kind of 25 meg file size, it's probably going to be a real edge case that anyone does actually want to go through all of that data. Okay. Sure. And right, I think I've actually gone through all of that a lot quicker than I expected. I'm just coming up on half an hour. Ah, okay, so that was actually pretty close. Beautiful. So, I'm just trying to find my mouse again. Um, so yeah, time for questions. Just come on. Oh, I haven't broken it. Yeah, I haven't broken it. All right. Did anyone ask, want to ask a question? We've got. Um, we'll start over here. So um, when you found you had like a really big layer, like with a lot of data. Um, did you consider like having your own WMS server um, with uh, tile caching? Yeah, so that was one of the first things that we were talking about. The problem was um, because we were getting all of the data from the government, uh, they actually needed to host all of that data as one of the requirements that we had. We started actually discussing it and just given the fact that the deadlines were looming, um, we decided to kind of continue down the path we were going because essentially we didn't have a lot of confidence we were going to be able to hit that deadline and get something going. But yeah, that was actually a much more ideal option than what we wanted to do. Did you ever consider maybe like running a Postgres SQL database just to handle, just to hold all the shape files and then output as like GeoJSON in, into your leaflet map as, a, as another option? So, so then they're, they're just getting like, you know, a blob of JSON and essentially uh, out of, uh, and I know that Postgres tends to handle 
geometry is pretty well. Actually, I'm just realizing that I've said the wrong thing on the, when we split out all of those files, we actually did convert all of that to GeoJSON. Um, but in the end, we actually had those as file fields connected to the different nodes. And that was, be, once again, just given the timelines and what we had coming out of data, we needed to have something that was going to be a bit flexible. Uh, Postgres probably would have, yeah, might have been a good solution to that too. Yeah. Um, just two questions. If you could have used modules, would you have used the modules instead of...? Um, it's a little bit hard to say. So Leaflet is, um, is really good and I've used it several times before. Uh, the issue is, yeah, I think there is actually a patch out there to get rid of the way that it actually manages sessions. Um, because we're hosting all of this on uh, Acquia and we've got Varnish and actually Akamai in front, uh, as soon as Leaflet um, starts using those sessions and authenticating the sessions, yeah. we're just going straight past the cache. Uh, and that's something that we just couldn't do. Um, on the actual launch time of the budget, the traffic spikes uh, you know, quite incredibly because you know, all of the large accounting firms have basically half of their you know, staff going in and actually downloading all of the budget documents. Uh, so yeah, destroying the cache just wasn't, uh, wasn't an option. And, and did you look at open layers or...? Um, I haven't actually used the open layers module. Uh, I know that, yeah, I know that it's out there, but I haven't actually tried that one myself. Yeah, two was good, three's crazy. Crazy good, crazy bad? Both. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> what about that thing in the 90s, image maps or whatever? Where you could hover over the... Thing. Sorry. Oh, I don't know that one. What was it called? <laughs> I think I remember what that was called. Um, any other questions? Scanning, Thanks. scanning. Up here. Yeah. Hey, Kurt. Thanks for the presentation. It's really good. Um, just had a question. As far as I understand, that page was just outputting pretty big um, dump of JSON. Yep. So what kind of caching strategies did you use to actually make it faster? Is it just views? It is just uh, just views and um, services views. Uh, so to be honest, we're probably relying a lot on Varnish and Akamai uh, in terms of caching, but uh, all of the views they get output, there's, um, they all get cached in the browser as well. So once you've actually loaded it up the first time, it is actually pretty quick. Um, and there's only uh, like a few hundred uh, projects. So the size of the JSON is actually quite small. Um, one of the things we were looking at initially, because uh, services and services views weren't in GovCMS, um, was something that we weren't overly happy with, was basically outputting a view, but um, using data attributes uh, you know, to actually add all of the extra data we needed. And although it's possible, it would have been pretty slow, and we would have had to do a lot of thinking around how we were going to cache that and make it snappy. Um, and doing that on top of having the large data files and all of those things, it was starting to kind of make us sweat a little bit and we were kind of, uh, as we actually got more and more of the data, um, things just started to get a little bit scarier to be honest because uh, for the first part of the project we were kind of flying blind a little bit in terms of uh, knowing what we were going to have to work with. Um, so yeah, I mean it's lucky that we had uh, services there to, uh, to actually use. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges of course of geolocation work is um, mobile and your experience in mobile. So could you perhaps touch on, you know, did you cater for mobile or optimise? Uh, did you change layouts? All that kind of thing. We ended up not being able to do mobile uh, on this particular project, which was a bit of a shame. Um, one of the major reasons was actually just around the design and we didn't get a design that was actually approved uh, by the time we were ready to go live. Um, obviously, as you know, mob mobile uh, maps can be quite tricky. If you just kind of dump one in the middle of the page as you're scrolling up, all of a sudden you hit the map and then you're scrolling the map and you can't actually get back to what you were trying to do and it's, it's quite painful. Um, I think one of the good solutions to that is um, apps like uh, you know, Zomato and other places where you actually click on a map icon and then you go into a full screen map and you've got another little icon to flick back to a normal view. Uh, something like that kind of gets around those issues. Um, in terms of uh, the size of the files, like that actually ended up being the main, 
one of the other main reasons that we couldn't go there. But I think with the solution we delivered in the end, uh, there wasn't really a technical limitation in how we did that. Um, also, in terms of the geolocation, we haven't actually implemented the geolocation in this solution at the end either. Uh, once again, we weren't delivering it on mobile, so it wasn't quite as relevant. But uh, we've actually used IPFI quite successfully on other projects. Um, Sorry, which one was that one? Uh, IPFI, I-P-I-F-Y, I think, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's actually been a, a fantastic solution. So we do all of the um, geolocation essentially on the front end, uh, which means that we've still got Varnish, Akamai, etc., all running. We're serving up completely cached pages, um, but we can then do the geolocation and react to it once, uh, once the page is loaded. So in hindsight, do you think there's an argument for if you had another GovCMS project doing mapping that um, out of the box GovCMS isn't really up for it or would you be like, well, we've worked out how to do it, let's just do it that way? No, look, I think basically with services and services views, you can actually push all of the data that you need out so that you can do most of it in the, um, in the theme. Uh, it is a little bit tricky depending on the requirements. I think we've got possibly another client coming up soon um, and they almost want like a, just a single page site that is a map. Um, been kind of causing me a little bit of stress <laughs> coming up to that one and thinking, okay, just given no module code, um, how are we going to tackle all of this with uh, you know, just elements kind of dynamically coming in and out of the page all the time? Um, I think it is doable. And yeah, once again, it's just services being able to output JSON and uh, make those requests with JavaScript, all of a sudden it all kind of opens up. Sure. Um, more questions? Hi. Uh, yep, we've got Mark back. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, do you think it would make a difference uh, if you were to serve these uh, maps if, if you didn't have it in the GeoJSON format from something like a Geo server, like GeoNode? instead of straight out of Drupal? Uh, yeah, look, it probably would um, make a difference if we had access to something like that at the time. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at for the next mapping project we're doing is uh, national maps. Um, so I don't know if you've seen that. It's basically something that integrates with data.gov.au uh, and you can immediately kind of just serve up any data from data.gov.au that has WMS or GeoJSON in it. Um, so that's actually a really good tool. Um, what we'll be looking at isn't national maps itself, but uh, using Terra.js, which is the JavaScript library that sits underneath it, and doing a custom implementation of that. So in that particular project, we are going to have access to a, um, to a GIS server, and all of a sudden, our options kind of start to broaden out a little bit. Thank you. Yeah. So I guess I um, need to thank two people. Uh, first is the designer of the slideshow. Uh, that's <laughs> fantastic. Uh, and also Kurt, so please give him a round of applause.